sort of NHS trust. And we're going to hear about the, the PPE issues from a from a practitioner's point of view rather than a theoretical point of view. So how it was sort of affected and, and the actions that were needed to be taken. Um, the session is being recorded, as Brenton said. If you could post any questions in the chat uh, function, that would be really good. Uh, I haven't really got anything else other to say other than if you haven't voted uh, for the or in the uh, council elections yet, uh, please feel free to do so. I think the closing date is Friday. Um, so please make your voice heard. And just a reminder that the AGM is coming up as well, which uh, we're able to attend for those that are chartered and above. So on that note, if there's nothing that I've forgotten, I will hand you over to Kath. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, Stuart, can you see my slides okay? Yeah, we've got you. Yeah. Marvellous, thank you. Right, so um, I'll make a start then. So my name is Kath Titley. I'm the Health and Safety Team Manager for Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital NHS Trust. Um, you'll note that the slides are on a white background. That's because I'm speaking in a personal capacity this evening um, as a member of IOSH, although with the knowledge and support of my organisation. So, as you might imagine, um, our roles as health and safety practitioners in NHS have um, just been turned upside down since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the things that's become extremely close to my own heart is respiratory protective equipment and how we protect our staff um, from the threat presented by COVID-19 to their health, the health of our community and the health of our patients. So what follows today is very much our own story, really. Um, we, um, I'll take you through the situation we were in pre-pandemic, how we responded to the first wave, where we are now, and the things that we're looking at for the future, and really a little bit of reflection on what we've learned as we've gone through. Okay, so let's start off with where we were in the pre-pandemic phase. So within healthcare, we've always had to deal with threats from airborne diseases. And we've traditionally used um, FFP3s as, as our preferred option for disposable respirators. So FFP3s act as a filter. And what they do is they take particulate out of the air. So the negative pressure devices, um, with the effort of inhalation, you draw air through the filter material and viral particles get caught in the material or bacterial particles, depending on the pathogen. Um, that you are trying to protect your wearer from. So in the same ways we would protect from dusts, we conceptualise viruses and bacterial particles in the air as particles which we can filter out if they're the right size to be caught in the filter material. So we've always had a history of using respirators for flu, particularly since the swine flu pandemic of um, 2009 to 2010. And that was the application that we used them for most um, in our trust. There were lots of other applications for them, but we saw fewer of them. So for tuberculosis, we, we are in Shropshire, our hospitals are in Telford and Shrewsbury. We're simply not in an area with a high population vulnerable to TB, which is more of an, um, an inner city um, sort of concern. We'd wear an FFP3 to protect staff from chicken pox and measles. But in practice, most people who are working um, on our workforce are already immune by virtue of being adults and either being vaccinated as children or having had chicken pox as children. More recently, FFP3s would be the respirator of choice for the other coronaviruses, so for um, sudden acute respiratory syndrome or SARS and Middle East respiratory syndrome or MERS. And there's been outbreaks over the last 10 years or so of those, but they've never developed into a full-blown pandemic. And most recently before coronavirus, the most significant threat that we would consider respirators for was Ebola, although, again, there were very few cases that actually made it into the UK and we had none in Shropshire where we had contingency plans in place. OK, so this is very much about equipment that's worn by our nursing staff and our healthcare assistants and our supporting allied health professionals when they're dealing with patients. 
So down at the bottom of the screen here, I've taken um, a figure from an HSC publication. You probably recognise the figure if you have anything to do with RPE in your own um, workplace. And for various reasons, our bias was always towards disposable respiratory protective equipment only. And a few reasons for that. Firstly, it's much easier to throw something away than it is to make sure it's properly clean for reuse. Disposable RP doesn't have to be stored, doesn't have to be decontaminated. And apart from a visual check before you don it, it doesn't need an awful lot in the way of maintenance either. More importantly, however, our nursing staff's view was always very, very strongly that reusable RPE of any sort was frightening for our patients. So our typical patient is older, they're more likely to have dementia than the general population, and there are various things which happen in the course of people's medical treatment which gives them a temporary delirium, whether that's coming around from an anaesthetic, the effect of infection or the effect of a medication. So our strong bias was, just, was towards an FFP3. It looks a bit like a surgical mask. Okay. Because we were mainly dealing with flu, we had a pattern of seasonal demand. So pre-pandemic, we had a quite traditional pattern that as we came into winter, uh, certainly by this stage in the year, we'd be looking at our admissions areas. We would be um, getting the current staff fit tested to an FFP3 and we would focus tightly on those admissions areas. So our emergency department, our A&E, our medical admissions unit, our surgical um, admissions unit and our children's um, admission units. Our rationale for that was always that we didn't have that much in the way of flu outbreaks. When we had patients in, the admitting departments would do the initial assessment and we had time to work out what we would do for the, um, the other wards. So we always made sure that we had some resource available in winter months to do that reactive, making sure that we could protect our staff from flu. And we had a trained fit tester resource available in-house and we were very fortunate to have a long and close working relationship with our local RPE supplier who's Firesafe International in Atcham. We went, looked to them for training and we looked to them for advice. So we thought we probably weren't in too bad um, a position. And most importantly, we had a history of getting it right for flu. So this slide talks about fit tests and fit checks. Again, if you're already familiar with RPE, I'm sure you're familiar with this already. But for those who are not, the fit test is what makes the respirator um, reliable. It, what's it, makes, it makes it work reliably. So the idea is, is that when your wearer is inhaling, you want them to breathe through the filter material, so your particulate matter is caught in the material. What you don't want is for them to be um, breathing around the seal to the face because that means that there's a route for unfiltered air coming in. So this is why you fit test for um, tight fitting face pieces. Faces vary in shape and size and makes the models vary slightly in their characteristics. So it's a case of making sure during the course of the fit test that you're getting a respirator which is actually going to protect the person in the real world as opposed to having met a particular standard which might be printed on the respirator or its packet. Okay. Um, we had a long history of stable supplies of FFP3s and we had four makes and models in use which we reckon fit about 95% of our working population which was great so it was quite simple to organise um, and we would train our staff to do fit checks when they put it on so that they had the best chance of the respirator giving them some real world protection. So we'd focus on putting it on properly, making sure it fit them, making sure that any adjustments were done. OK, so we thought we were in a reasonable position and we would always use the qualitative method of fit testing. Again, for those of you who were involved in RPE um, provision, you may be familiar with this already, but there's some really good, uh, good things about the qualitative fit test and we would use this 3M method. So essentially, it's a taste test. In a qualitative fit test, what you're doing is you're spraying a sweet or a bitter solution into a hood to a known process, having checked what this wearer can actually taste, so you understand something about their thresholds of perception. And what you're looking for is to make sure that the respirator fits well enough that unfiltered air isn't going through, isn't going around the respirator, but it's going through. And the particles which make up the sweet or um, or bitter solutions, the saccharin or the bitrex, would be suspended in the aerosol that you'd put into the hood with the nebulizer. 
um, and that would be your test. Essentially, if your wearer couldn't test, couldn't taste the test solutions, you were probably okay. It indicated a good fit, and the chances are that as they breathed in, flu would be filtered out, or TB would be filtered out, or any of those other pathogens. Okay, so it's relatively cheap. It's easy to learn. You do it after a one-day course and then some experience. And as well as my own staff in the health and safety team, we're not a big team. There's five of us. Okay, we had colleagues from our divisions, mostly nursing staff, who were also trained in the method. And we had some practices in-house to make sure that that ran reasonably smoothly. So when if you talk to us before the pandemic about how we were doing, we would have said, no, I think we're all right, actually. I think we've got the bones of a system in place and we can ramp it up when we need to. So our pandemic plans were focused on flu. And I know there's been a huge amount of discussion in media about how that led us to probably plan for the wrong pathogen and for the for the the wrong method of um, spread and the wrong scale um, as well. So our um, pandemic planning from the health and safety team point of view was focused on making sure that we would get PPE and RPE to our staff in a timely fashion as per Public Health England guidance on how to protect yourselves from, um, from specific infections. And our role was very much about the provision of respiratory protective equipment and particularly fit testing. So in our flu plans, we would drop our day to day role and we would um, pick up mass fit testing. That was fine. We thought that was OK. It had served us well in the swine flu pandemic of 2009 to 10. Okay. So that was our pre pandemic phase. Then we come to January 2021 and things at uh, January 2020, sorry, and things started to change. Now, this is a timeline document, which I appreciate will be difficult to read on screen um, for um, most of us. The slides will be made available later. Um, what this is showing you is that from January 2020, um, the, the situation was changing. OK, so 6th of January, according to um, this timeline, the first international reports of viral pneumonia outbreaks in China were kind of making it through, published in the Times. OK, 24th of January, um, COBRA committee met and the Health Secretary considered that at that point in time, the risk of the UK public was low. And on 31st of January, the UK had um, its first um, confirmed cases in the UK. What happened next was a really fast build up and I suspect must much faster than it would have been had it been a flu pandemic, which was part of um, the difference in how things developed. So in this period of January and February 2020, we were watching the news from China. We were watching the changes to guidance. We had travel advisories in place and we were preparing our staff to deal with people who had the right travel history to be concerned about whether they had um, been exposed to this, um, what was at that point called Wuhan novel coronavirus, which we now know um, as um, COVID-19 is the disease. We were doing some general preparing. We were dusting off our flu plans. Again, remembering that this was geared up for a swine flu pandemic. We weren't really prepared for the scale of what was coming. OK, so we knew that we would have to up our game with the numbers of staff we had um, fit tested and we were already working on our admissions areas from that point of view. OK, so then we come to the start of the first wave, which is generally considered to have started in earnest in March 2020. So during this period of February and March 2020, what was happening is that we were getting these emerging theories of transmission. OK, this was based quite a lot on learning from the SARS and MERS coronaviruses. Um, and there was learning across from those. So you may already be familiar with this, but the transmission routes were thought to operate in three different ways. OK, so looking at the um, diagram with the two people facing each other at the top of the slide. In the red text in the middle, you've got what we call droplet transmission. So as I'm speaking now, I'm not wearing a mask. I'm alone in my office. If I had um, people with me, I would be wearing a type 2 R surgical mask, which is standard for my trust. And what we're trying to do there is stop that mode of droplet transmission. So as people um, speak face to face, as they cough, as they sing, as they sneeze, you get these um, small droplets which come forward. This um, control of droplet transmission 
is the reason why face coverings became um, universal at times during the pandemic. And it's the source of the six feet or two metres rule for social distancing, because the idea is, is that as you get droplet emissions, they're heavy, they'll fall to the floor, they don't stay in the air for very long. OK, but because those droplets don't stay in the air and they fall to the floor. This is what we call the fomite route of transmission. So this is when you get viral particles which are surviving on hard surfaces in the environment. Okay, And it's this fomite route of transmission which drives the emphasis on cleaning and hand hygiene, which was pushed very, very heavily in um, government information films and media reports early in the pandemic and caused um, healthcare to um, change its cleaning methods to much, make much more use of chlorine-based disinfectants than we'd had done previously. What we're worried about though at this stage is aerosols at the top of the diagram. So there are certain procedures which we do in healthcare which take those droplets which are in the air as they're exhaled, but we turn them into an aerosol. We break them up into smaller particles. They get, they become suspended in the air because they're lighter. Okay, and these are fairly common, and we call them aerosol generating procedures or AGPs. So the typical things which would generate an aerosol from respiratory secretions include intubation or extubation, um, if somebody's undergoing surgery or um, or ventilation, bronchoscopy when an endoscope is used to look into the lungs or respiratory tract, open suctioning, manual ventilation. So if we're engaged in a CPR attempt and we're doing manual bagging, um, that would be considered an aerosol generating procedure. All forms of non-invasive or invasive ventilation um, and some administration of oxygen are fairly typical. And it's those aerosols, it's those tasks that we do that produce the aerosols which drive the requirement for respirators. So what we're trying to do with respirators is protect staff from aerosolized particles um, of coronavirus in the air. Okay. So that was what we knew about transmission routes. And this led to rapid changes to PPE and RPE guidance. So this timeline, and again, if the text is too small, I apologise, but the slides will be um, made available later, comes from a BMJ article, um, which was uh, published in um, 2021, so after some time for reflection. Okay, Again, this is another timeline. On the left-hand side of the screen, we start with March 2020, and on March the 2nd was the first time in guidance when all NHS organisations were alerted to start thinking about how they were going to provide fit testing and PPE training if they didn't already have it in hand. Okay, By 6th of March, um, we had a move away from FFP3s in guidance to um, fluid resistant surgical masks when there was no aerosol generating procedure. Um, by um, the end of March, we had the formal guidance to put people in FFP3s when they were undergoing an aerosol generating procedure. And as um, April went on, um, the supply chains within the NHS started to gear up to try and get enough respirators to trust in order to make sure that we could actually provide them to our staff. Okay, That demand for RPE, I don't think anyone was expecting before it happened. Okay, So the increased demand from RPE, I can share with you our activity. Okay, So this was the individual fit tests which were conducted in my trust. So we're only two very, very middling sized district hospitals. We're not a large trust at all. In the tw uh, 24 months ending last month, and this is our substantive staff only, so this doesn't take into account the people who were agency staff members or locum doctors, or indeed the people from our local care homes um, and our Nuffield Hospital, who we also helped out with fit testing resource when, um, when we were asked to at various points in the pandemic. So around the left-hand side of the slide here, you can see our typical numbers in October, November time. Um, we would certainly be comfortably under 100 fit tests a month, and that was fine. We could absorb that in the resource that we had. By February, we were trying to deal with our admissions areas. And I think it's fair to say that by February, me and my team had completely come out of our pre-pandemic role and had taken up our pandemic role 100% of the time. By March, that had increased. 
um, as, and much of our time was solely focused on the risks which would be ameliorated by PPE and RPE. And by April, we were um, heading for the first peak. Now, in order to meet this demand, um, we were fortunate enough to have 12 staff members redeployed from other areas. We trained them at speed. We supervised them very hard in the early shifts to ensure competence. And um, between us, that's how we managed to do over two and a half thousand individual fit tests in April. Now, in this data, we can see the waves, essentially. So the first wave is thought to have started in March 2020. And you can see that we get a peak which falls down to August and September. The second wave is thought to have started in August 2020. And you can see that we get a peak that builds in our fit testing activity. And the third wave is thought to have started in May 2021. And again, we get a bit of an increase in what we're doing. What's underlying this is that an awful lot of this was repeat fit testing of the same person. So um, we were trying to keep up with stock changes. And I just checked before we came online. Um, in this two year period, we've dealt with 22 different makes of models and FFP3, and we actually only have 11 of them available to us still at the moment. And if you compare that to the four that we had as our long-term stable stocks previously, this is what was driving this constant repetition of fit tests. In practice, what we were doing is trying to keep on top of fluctuating stock. Okay. It wasn't just F respirators that we had trouble keeping in stock. Around this time, um, you could not buy a qualitative fit test kit for any money. We were loaning them out to um, neighbouring organisations um, in desperation. And at one point we ran out of the bitter and sweet solutions, which um, we used as consumables in the qualitative fit testing process. Um, that was reflecting national and international, in fact, global demand for those. And we came extremely close to our own pathology lab staff making them for us. Um, we came to within about 48 hours of that. We managed to, with the help of our local RPE specialist, find the recipe for those, if you like, and source um, some of the raw materials. The amusing part of that was that um, who knew that saccharin is principally made in one um, manufacturing plant in the northwest of England and I don't think they could quite understand exactly why they had quite so much interest until we explained what we were up to. Okay, So in this period speed was of the essence. What we were trying to do was to make sure that the hospitals had enough staff who were properly protected to go and work the rotors for the wards that um, we were um, still operating. And I'm proud to say and I'm genuinely proud of this that my trust took a stance very early in the pandemic that we would not send anyone in with inadequate protection. That probably saved some of our staff, if we're honest, I think. Um, but it did put an awful lot of um, demand on what we were doing with fit testing, how quickly we could get to it. And the impact of that was a distortion of rotors. So if you were fit tested, you could work in some areas. If you weren't, you ended up in lower risk areas. We knew we couldn't maintain that. That was too hard on our staff. We were essentially having an exposed population um, and uh, a non-exposed population. So we knew we had to speed up. So that's when we changed to quantitative fit testing. So this is Claire, who's one of our occupational therapists, whose photograph is reproduced with her permission. She very kindly agreed to be photographed while she was going undergoing quantitative fit testing using a port count machine. And this is the ambient particle count method. So unlike um, a qualitative fit test, which relies on the where a tasting or not tasting a solution sprayed at them, this one counts particles in the air around it. You can see that there's a tube that goes into the respirator to look at the atmosphere in the respirator itself. It samples that and it compares the ratio of the two to produce a fit factor. Fit factor um, passes 100, um, higher than that, and you're confident that the respirator will protect um, staff member. Lower than that, we'd consider that a failed fit test and we'd try a different make and model. Okay. What we found remarkably quickly is our staff trusted this method harder. Okay. The machines had an air of accuracy about them. 
What we think was really happening, though, is that this was a period of high anxiety for our staff. Everything was changing all at once. The demands were phenomenal during this period of time on every individual who was still working on site. And what we actually believe happened is that our staff trusted this method because it took their subjective response out. <clears throat> so instead of having a trained and skilled fit tester asking you whether you could taste the sweet or bitter solution and you starting to doubt yourself whether you could or not and knowing it's quite a high stakes decision to make. Actually, that worry was taken away from you. Your fit, your fit factor depended on a number on the machine and not on your own subjective response. Managers liked it because it was quicker and they could get their staff in and out um, faster, you know, on a quantitative fit test. You don't have to wait for people to not be able to taste the solution they've had for the previous fit tests. And it was quicker to fit multiple masks. So when we were going through this intense period of recalling people constantly to fit or see if they fitted to what we had in stock in that particular week, then this gave us more chance of keeping up with it. What we also found in this period is that it was utterly essential for staff to be able to trust in their PPA. At the first peak, you know, if you cast our minds back, it was very different to how it is now. And people knew that there was significant risk in their work. So we felt we owed it to them that they can trust their PPA. And so quite quickly, we decided that if a staff member needed to come back and have their fit, chest, fit test redone for their own um, perception of safety in their in their PPE or in order to trust their respirator we would do that. Um, not everyone did but for certain staff members that's how they developed their trust in their PPE is that they had multiple fits to the same make and model of respirator. Okay so as well as this fit testing that we were doing we also had to make sure that people understood how to put on their equipment and their full PPE ensemble so that um, it would actually cover the areas that we needed it to cover um, and not interfere with each other. And also to remove it again without contaminating themselves. So staff were very aware from the lessons of Ebola that I don't know if you remember the, um, the one case we had, the um, Scottish nurse. It's widely believed that her method of um, transmission of Ebola was um, as she removed her PPE, so it was her doffing method, and that lesson kind of stuck home quite hard. So there were national videos issued by Public Health England, which were adopted, and um, we used those principally as a method to train donning and doffing um, of personal protective equipment. Now, those videos are available online on YouTube. When you get the slides, hopefully these links will still work. That was my intention, is that you would be able to go through and look. And what we had to do was make sure our staff were comfortable with those processes. And in order that they could actually do them in practice, we created donning and doffing stations at key areas outside and, and throughout our wards and clinical departments in order to set up the buddy system, whereas a colleague would support you to get your PPE on and make sure they had availability of mirrors um, easily to make sure that you were donning your respirator correctly for you. Okay. And this is what we were aiming for. So this poster is the visual guide to safe PPE, which was current um, in the first wave and has been sort of tweaked as time's gone on. But we essentially had two different levels of PPE that we're trying to get our staff into. So on the left-hand side of my screen, we have somebody who's dealing with patients who um, may have COVID, but you're not doing an aerosol generating procedure. So you're not doing a procedure that you know is putting viral particles into the air and keeping them there in suspension for longish periods of time. So we wanted you in a surgical mask, we wanted you in an apron, and we wanted you on gloves. And we might want you in eye protection if the procedure you're doing has got a risk of splashing, something like flushing a cannula or taking blood, you know, those kinds of things where there was fluid around, uh, free fluid around, which might travel up to your face. On the other side of this post, we have the ensemble that's required for aerosol generating procedures. So we absolutely want your eyes protected at this point because it was a known route of transmission, um, a real known route of exposure. We want you in a respirator and we wanted it to be fit tested. We never had to resort to using FFP2s in anger, but we did fit test a lot of people to them as a contingency plan until we worked out that we could actually keep 
a continuous supply of FFP3s at that point. We want you in a long sleeved fluid repellent gown and we want you in gloves with no gap between sleeve of your gown and your gloves. So this is what we were aiming for. And it's no, um, I don't think it's any surprise to say this is incredibly hard on staff. So it's hard physically, the fatigue is high, it's hard emotionally because the PPE is isolating as you're wearing it, has a desperate impact on communication, particularly if you rely on lip reading or the person you're with rel relies on lip reading. And it just added to the all round strangeness of it all, really. So some of the specific things that we had to deal with in this phase included skin integrity. So these photographs don't come from my trust. These photographs are taken from um, a widely shared Royal College of Nursing um, journal. But they show the characteristic pattern of damage that's caused by wearing a respirator for extended periods of time. Now, we were putting staff in respirators for 12 hour shifts with about an hour's total break kind of scheduled into their day. And the guidance at the time said that a respirator was probably good for sessional use for about four hours. So I don't know these people in this slide here, but I do know that we saw staff with typical patterns of skin damage to their faces, which were the same. And um, I've shown this photo to um, several fit testers in my own team. And interestingly, they can guess the respirator that caused them. And it's because it was such a reliable effect that we saw them. So the lady um, on the right hand side of my screen, um, who's not holding her phone up, we think that's a 3M8833 because it's got a wide ceiling ring and this little mottled patch around the points of the cheekbones. We think the other one um, was a different cone shaped mask. It was that characteristic that experienced fit testers could guess. Um, the pattern of damage. So what we did to support our staff with, with this is that we have tissue viability specialist nurses who usually advise on continence care and pressure ulcers. Um, these were best placed, these nurses were best placed to um, help us out to educate staff on the products to use to protect their skin from moisture damage and pressure damage. So you know, the, the core of their specialism was the same. It was the mechanism of the injury, which, which was different. So we used a combination of breaks so that people were getting a chance to come out of their PPE and, you know, try and alleviate some of the moisture damage. Advice, advice on how to use moisturisers so they didn't exacerbate the problem. Advice on barrier films that we would more commonly use in continence care, but which formed a physical barrier um, between um, the face and the respirator. And as a last resort measure, um, very thin um, specialist dressings, which would of course mean we had to repeat the fit test to make sure the respirator still fitted with the dressing across the bridge of the nose. Okay, As well as the physical impact on this, the impact on staff self-esteem is worth mentioning. You know, these are very, very visible um, effects that they would kind of take away with them um, out of the hospital into their personal life. And for some people that was hard. Okay, so all of that so far is talking about the people that we could get into tight fitting RPE. Okay, but not everyone can wear it. So, for the first time ever in our history, we introduced loose fitting RPE. Okay, so we are an overwhelmingly female organisation. Um, I think at the moment our staff is currently more than 80% female and less than 20% male, and that's not particularly unusual for a hospital trust. Okay, so whereas in more traditionally male dominated industries, you might have more history of using loose fitting RPE um, in recognition of preferences about facial hair, to be honest, wasn't really something we dealt with in, in, in earnest before because we hadn't actually had that much demand for RPE, not really, okay? So there were two particular groups who we had to meet the needs of, okay? So one was our doctors who don't shave for religious reasons. And I say doctors because actually that was where most of our um, workforce in Shropshire sort of came from. Um, but of course, you know, it's not just doctors, but that was our biggest staff group affected. So these were people who held um, long held and deeply held religious beliefs. Um, and of course, they happen to be high risk groups anyway, because the risk factors known to make um, 
severe illness and death more likely as a result of COVID infection included being male and it included being um, from black and minority ethnic populations. So our kind of older male Asian doctors were people that we were really worried about in the first place anyway. So we had to really take care of them and at first we didn't have a good solution. So some doctors chose to shave as a short-term measure and we gave them an undertaking that we would get loose fitting RP as fast as we humanly could so that they could stop doing that. Okay. Others felt that their religious belief prohibited them from doing so and we respected that and we changed the work they were doing until we could get loose fitting RPE. Like everything else at this stage in the pandemic though, it was incredibly difficult to come by. So the photograph on the slide is a 3M um, welding set type or you know industrial set that you might see and they're not so very dissimilar from what we ended up buying because we realized that the same specification for um, welding is also happens to be the same standard of protection required for coronavirus so we worked with a local supplier and we began to get to grips with the difficulties of managing reusable PPE, which isn't in our repertoire because for infection control reasons, most of our items are single use and disposable. Then you don't have to worry about the decontamination processes that go with them. The other group that we had to worry about was our smaller women. So pre-pandemic, we'd had a very, very small respirator um, available to us. It was very expensive, but it was fitted female faces beautifully, particularly smaller female faces. We simply didn't understand until the pandemic kicked in that it was made in one plant in Taiwan. And when the borders were closed, very few were actually escaping. And the, the global demand for um, RPE was so high anyway that there just wasn't ability to keep up. And we've only just got those that particular make and model of respirator back in the last few weeks and then only in small numbers. So one of the groups that we bought our loose fitting RPE for was smaller women. And this added another burden to them because this isn't the PPE we would have bought for people of smaller stature had we had a better choice on the market. OK, so for these reasons, we felt that there was a high need to support for staff. And we had to keep on looking for better solutions for our small women in particular. So to make sure that we did support staff adequately, we created what we called hood libraries, where um, the uh, PAPR systems and head tops would be kept. And the hood libraries were staffed 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And they were responsible for one to one user training um, and assisting people with their pre use checks. So, again, that we could foster a sense of trust in the respiratory, the respiratory protective equipment that we were giving to our staff. OK, one of the things we had to get to grips with, though, at speed was decontamination processes. So if you are using a PAPR system and it might be issued to one person only and it might be used for a physical contaminant, which you can take away with a wipe, then it's not very difficult. But we were dealing with something that you can't see, something that you can't smell or taste. Um, and we had to have a high level of confidence that we would actually be giving people clean PPE back. So we have um, a department whose primary role is to clean surgical equipment, reusable surgical equipment um, used in theatres. Working with the manufacturers and working with our own infection prevention and control team and our own microbiology team, we came up with ways of repurposing our washer dryer machines um, in such a way that they would kill COVID particles on, um, on the head tops themselves and that the manufacturers said would not destroy their equipment. OK, so we had to work very closely with those to make sure that we had decent processes in place. I can't tell you what a cultural change this was for us. We'd gone from deciding that a reusable half mask respirator was too frightening for our patients to approaching them in a PAPR system with a hard head top. So um, I think on a more positive note, loose fitting RPE is with us to stay now. Um, and that is good for the people who don't shave for religious beliefs and in fact, any men who can't shave for medical reasons either. Um, but if you'd have told me in 2019 that in April 2020, we would have been buying this and taking it onto our wards, I would not have believed you. 
Okay, so that was kind of our first wave. Some of our key challenges I've alluded to already. The main one was the uncertainty and the instability of FFP3 um, respirators and the fit testing stocks to use them. I've already mentioned, I think, that um, in the course of this, we went through 22 different makes and models which were coming in and out of stock. Okay, sometimes we were working with as little as three or four days worth of stock um, at the burn rate we were getting at the time. And myself and our procurement colleagues, we were having to decide constantly on the balance between fit testing and use because fit testing destroys a mask in the process um, of conducting the test. So we set a priority order. We would always prioritise our ITUs and our theatres because that's where our most acutely unwell patients were. And those were the areas that we had to keep going first. And then next would be our supporting allied health professionals. The anxiety for our staff during this time was immense. So we never did send anybody in unprotected to a hazardous area, but that doesn't mean that people weren't fearful that we might come to that. And that was a really potent occupational stressor in its own right. Other people were concerned that if they didn't fit to a respirator that we had in stock in this constantly changing situation, that they would be redeployed into a job that they didn't want to do away from the more hazardous areas. Okay, so by anybody's measure, it was tricky to keep up with and I think it's fair to say that we didn't really understand at the start of the first wave why that was happening. It dawned on us later is because the worldwide demand for RPE was so very very high that they just simply weren't able to get the same product lines through so it made no sense to us at first. This slide comes from the National Audit Office um, report in November 2020 which was about um, the supply of, of PPE and the challenges of that. OK, so again, I appreciate the text is small, so I hope you can either see this here or on the slides if you view them later. So down the side here is the items of PPE which we would expect to use. And the column on the end here is the percent change in volume ordered from February to July 20 compared to the same period in the previous year. OK, down here at the bottom is respirators. The percentage change in volume ordered between the two years is 43,000%. Um, suddenly it makes sense of why we had disruptions to supply chains. OK, so we'd gone from this very, very stable supply of four respirators, which fit nearly everybody who could wear tight fitting PPE, to working with whatever we could get. And this is what drove up that demand for fit testing. And how can we have 12 people kind of working 12 hours a day, seven days a week and flat out in order to keep up uh, with um, with demand? Okay. But after a while, they got to grips with it and our procurement colleagues um, working with people in the region and nationally started to make sure that we were getting respirators that matched our fit testing data so that we had better continuity of supply. Another challenge in this period was non-compliant PPE which was coming through. So the NHS has technical standards for the PPE that it buys and some of the things we were getting simply did not match those standards. So on the screen here is an ear loop style of FFP3 I'm sure it does meet the standards for an FFP3, but it doesn't meet the NHS ones. And the reason that we um, don't like to use them is that they don't have a good range of fit. They're harder to get a good seal um, to the face. And without that seal to the face, they're not going to protect our staff member. So I think um, it feels like the bravest thing that myself and a, a, a key procurement colleague of mine ever did as a joint decision was reject a batch of ear loop FFP3s in. It was brave because we weren't always clear on what would come on the next day's push stocks, the stocks that were sent out by the national procurement. So we took a risk, but we felt that it was better to be honest and say that we didn't have PP for our staff than to give people a false sense of security with a non-compliant item, which we couldn't fit to their face adequately. OK, so it's a heavy burden, but we got through it essentially by very close team working. Okay. During this time as well, we were warned by our national procurement teams not to buy 3M products outside of the um, standard NHS supply chains. And this was because there was a massive problem with counterfeiting. So we learned quite quickly to stop looking outside of the supply chains because we were concerned about the quality of the products we were buying and we couldn't risk putting our staff at that sort of risk. Okay. In all of this time, our staff were looking to the media for messages of how they could protect themselves and to try and make sense of 
you know, the challenges that they were facing at work. So this particular article is um, from The Guardian in um, July 2020. And this is when stories were starting to come through about the behaviour of PPE suppliers. I don't know if they were accurate or not. But what I do know is that um, our staff were watching those articles and it was having a really negative impact on the morale if they felt that they weren't being supported to get their PPE um, when they needed it. And I say again, we never actually ran out of PPE, no items at all. We didn't send anybody in protect, unprotected, but it doesn't take away the potent fear of that happening in the future. And that's what we were dealing with on a day to day basis. OK, when there was poor practice on TV, it um, crept into our practice and we had to work to correct it. Classically, it's crossed straps on respirators, which would have um, the ability to um, compromise the fit. And certainly it wasn't the way they were fit tested. Sometimes, unfortunately, we would get colleagues come across from other trusts and maybe they they weren't quite on top of their fit testing. And we had to um, uh, overcome the belief that a fit check was enough. And we did some work with that and we had massive support from our communications team colleagues to make sure that we were keeping on pushing the positive messages, the things that people would do to protect themselves and perhaps warn away from some of the things that we were seeing which were likely to compromise their safety. Okay. In this time as well, we also saw distortions in staff beliefs about more or less effective forms of PPE, in particular respirators. And one thing we had to work on quite hard was a belief among some of our staff groups that reusables were somehow better than disposables. So we worked quite hard to explain that actually the reusables in terms of half mass respirators with P3 filters would actually create more work and give them less certainty of cleanliness of the item that put on onto their face and you know that they would breathe through than the disposable FFP3. So there was quite a lot of distortion of messages that we had to make sure that we um, combated in a timely way. And just to add to our problems, we had some heat wave events as well. So um, we've got staff in a lot more PPE than usual. Our hospitals are older. They do not have air conditioning as standard in all of our wards and clinical departments. And we had a heat wave. So suddenly we had to put a massive amount of focus on thermal comfort in order to just keep staff at work. OK, we worked really closely with our infection control and microbiology colleagues to make sure that we got the balance of risk. So if we had to put a portable air conditioning unit into an area, it would recirculate the air. That's against what we would normally do for infection control practices because of the potential for viral spread on air currents um, from patient to patient. But we had to balance that risk against temperatures of 35, 38 degrees was the highest we recorded and staff simply not being available to work for our patients anymore. So with some careful work, we came up with some compromises. So unsurprisingly, at national level, there was quite a lot of focus on psychological impact of the pandemic on staff. And this is just a snippet from an article which is referenced at the bottom of the slide and on the references slide here about the, the things people said about the emotional strain that they faced in that first wave. So this particular um, paper was written by researchers in Nottingham. And um, I think it's fair to say that myself and all the colleagues I've spoken to and shown this these, this particular paper to recognise the same impacts on our staff. So the researchers talked about despair and uncertainty. And certainly this first quote, the anxiety from uncertainty, daily changes to processes, having to adapt to my practice rapidly. If you remember that very quick change of guidance, which was coming throughout March and April in particular. A fear of getting it wrong because everything was so new. And people were trained, but it was new. They didn't have a lot of experience. They might be redeployed into different areas. A fear of infecting people and the consequences that that would, that would bring. And a, and a deep fear of taking the risk home to their families. This middle one, I think most of us felt at some point. This expectation to be some sort of hero, not sleeping at night, having panic attacks and being too ashamed to admit it to everyone. Quite a few of my colleagues in NHS were not all that keen on the Thursday night doorstep claps, the clap for carers. And it's this effect that I think they were tapping into, that it was well intentioned. And for the people who were engaging in it, it was something that they could do at a time when they felt out of control. So we understand 
why. And some of us are really appreciative of it. But for others, sometimes it was just one more source of pressure. And that was quite hard to balance. And it felt ungrateful. And that was even worse. Yeah. Okay. And this last one, this coping employer support. I wholeheartedly agree with this person who spoke in this research thing. I feel that if someone's on the front line and putting their lives on the line, they should be fully supported physically with PPE, emotionally and psychologically, and also financially. Okay. So my team focused on the physical and on the well-being side. Our workforce colleagues stepped up and massively increased the offer that was available to support people when they were struggling. So this diagram is taken from um, a regular staff newsletter. It always appears in the back pages so that on a weekly basis, staff are reminded of the sources of help and support which are, are um, available to them. Um, and I think there will be a need to continue pushing those messages for actually quite a long time. The impacts will be felt for a long time. We also had wobble rooms set up we're not blessed with an enormous amount of space, but we found some quiet spaces where staff could just get away, you know, um, take a few minutes and perhaps not have to have their public face on, which is um, something which uniform staff say that they feel quite acutely when they're just walking through the building. OK, small gifts also made the world of difference. Gifts of hand gels and hand creams, um, local restaurants sending in hot food. Um, and taking it up to wards when um, people knew that, you know, it to coincide with break times and so on. Um, and we also created some outside spaces for breaks in courtyards. We managed to get some benches and do a, a, a little bit of tidying up and landscaping so that we had a bit of a focus on welfare facilities. Interestingly, later in second wave, when those tiny incentives weren't there, I mean, I've never had so many Easter eggs as I did in April 2020, staff said that they missed them. And when you talk to staff about it, what they said was that somebody felt that they were worth sending those small items to, which kind of confirms this effect that it's not always about money um, in terms of rewards. Sometimes it's about small gestures which indicate um, which the recipient takes as indicating their worth. Okay. I think it's fair to say that in the first wave we learned an enormous um, amount about the interaction between the Equality Act and respiratory protective equipment. So I've already talked about religious belief, about the need to protect this particular section of our workforce who were specifically at higher demand because they were often from black and minority ethnic communities um, as well. We learned an awful lot about the compromises which people with disabilities and chronic health conditions are forced to make when their PPE is not on their side. So I think in terms of people who have hearing impairments, um, our um, uh, colleagues who um, might rely on lip reading or indeed their patients, the physical barriers are strong. And um, I don't think we've solved that one yet, actually. I think the market is still um, is still changing in response to that in, in the creation of clear surgical masks and clear um, fronted respirators. And people with chronic health conditions, you know, if you already had a neck problem, and then we gave you a hood. We were asking you to wear a head top and something at the small of your back. Not marvellous, not something we would have chosen to do had we had a different choice. And then in terms of um, male and female bodies, so sex is protected characteristic. When you talk about tight fitting RPE, it's almost compulsory to talk about shaving, isn't it? Because facial hair has such um, a compromise on the ability of a respirator to seal to your face. And you don't have to have very many hours of regrowth before that starts to have its impact. I will be honest, because we have a relatively small population of male clinical staff compared to a female population, we could deal with it by reassigning people to different duties if they needed respirators in the, the pre-pandemic era. Um, Post-pandemic, it's something that we had to get to grips with. So the BMJ opinion piece in the bottom of this slide here um, is 12th of March 20. So on the lead up to, um, uh, you know, the, the lead up to the first wave really hitting. And it's a discussion piece about whether doctors have a duty to shave as long as they're not protected by the, um, uh, the characteristic of religious belief. And I think it was probably quite controversial in that it concluded that, yes, they did have to, actually. And um, this was just something that had to happen in order to um, promote their own protection at work. So you, if you're involved in fit testing, you've probably seen 
this particular figure or one very like it before. So it's something we had to talk about a lot, a lot more than we'd ever done previously. So we had several versions of this laminated. We gave them to our fit testers. If we had a male staff member who wasn't usually clean shaven arrive for fit testing, we explained why. We explained that a respirator would not suit them. 99 times out of 100, the male staff member would then go to a ward, find a shaving kit, which would more likely be kept there for um, our patients' use and they would shave and they would come back because their motivation to be protected was very, very strong at that point in time. So I still can't say that it's something that we find is a really difficult um, issue to manage for us. Much more difficult was the difference between male and female bodies. So I've alluded um, in this presentation already to um, the idea that, unfortunately, most PPE fits men better than it does women. Um, Men's faces are wider on the average. These are um, anthropometry tables which are um, reproduced here. Um, the detail of them shows that um, male's faces are wider. They tend to be longer in the dimension of nose to jaw and they're better able to bear the excess weight or the excess fatigue that comes from being um, wearing a high level of, of RPE. And these things interact. So in terms of the staff who it was most difficult to find a respirator to fit them adequately and really give them adequate protection would be our smaller Asian staff, uh, female staff members um, because of um, different facial characteristics um, and different, different stature on the average. Okay, And I'm pleased to see that the Commons report that was published on Tuesday this week recognises that and recognises that in future planning there has to be um, more consideration given to diverse workforces to make sure that women actually are protected properly. And if you haven't read it, the um, book by um, Caroline Criado Perez called Invisible Women is all about this idea of the, the male body as the default and how that disadvantages women. There is a really interesting um, chapter in there on personal protective equipment, which, you know, if you have any um, interest in this, I would encourage you to read. OK. So that's kind of our first wave. By the time the second wave started from August 2020 on, frankly, we'd got to grips with it then. We knew what we were doing. OK, so we were still in a situation of sustained high demand for RPE and we still had continuing stock changes, including respirators that were coming in and out of stock quite quickly and sometimes at relatively short notice. However, things were definitely improving. We were starting to see the emergence of UK manufactured stocks of respiratory of, of respirators. Um, and we found better availability of reusable half mask respirators, which again were just impossible to come by, and particularly filters were very, very difficult to buy in first wave. And so for some of our smaller women, we were able to get them into reusables, um, which took away the burden of wearing a hood, which was also not particularly well designed for their body. But the real game changers in, in this sector was lateral flow testing, so we could have an awful lot more certainty about um, the infection status of our staff and patients and the vaccination program, which was um, gearing up in, um, in December. Those are the things which allowed us to restore services. And that was what was happening nationally. So if we come on now to where we are now, the third wave, Public Health England has become the UK Health Security Agency. Ironically, in their guidance, they now push much more um, definitely a hierarchy of control approach. But the impact of that is to increase RPE use where other controls fail. And in particular, where space is limited or where ventilation is not as good as it could be, there's an increase in the use of respirators. So I think we are starting to see a step change in healthcare PPE. And I couldn't predict when that will end. OK. And knocking on from that, many trusts, including my own, have learned from the Cambridge study of the second wave where um, Adam Brooks Hospital moved away from the Public Health England guidance about surgical masks and respirators and put more of their, mask, their, their staff members in respirators. What they found is in second wave compared to first wave, their occupational infection rates were massively lower. So we've adopted that as well. We think our staff um, would benefit from that and our staff agree actually they um, they've been pleased to see that change okay our focus now is all about resilience 
So going into winter 20, um, 2021 to 22, what we're aiming is for all of those staff to be fitted to at least two, ideally three FFP3s. So that if we get stock outages, we are um, not putting somebody's ability to protect themselves at risk. And also in terms of that pattern of skin damage, if you are starting to develop skin damage, if we can give you a different shape respirator that sits on your face in a slightly different way, it will help you to recover and help that to not progress. OK, and we're still running a fit testing service, which runs Monday to Friday office hours to keep up with temporary staff, to keep up with locums, to keep up with new starters to make sure that we have that resilience in our workforce and also to um, make sure that we can get the furthest reaches of people who need to be um, need to be fit tested. So one thing we're still working on slightly is our trust decided um, to follow the um, Resuscitation Council UK guidelines in regard chest compressions as an aerosol generating procedure. That means that we probably haven't quite got to all of the people who might potentially be involved in a CPR attempt. And so we have an algorithm in place which protects them until somebody um, who is able to wear um, level three PPE with the benefit of an adequate fit test um, straight away. And one of the things that's emerging at the moment is that um, when we look at valved respirators and PAPR systems, they don't filter the air that you exhale in quite the same way as an unvalved respirator would. So an unintended feature of the design of unvalved respirators, if you like, is that they protect the patient from the healthcare worker as well as the healthcare um, work, as well as the um, the other way around, the healthcare worker from the patient. So the risk is small associated with valve respirators and PAPR in units, but it's something that we're looking at afresh now. Okay. So some lessons to start summing up. Really, what we've learned is that you can't work in isolation um, when you're responding to. Um, a crisis of this scale, really. So while we are still the lead department within the trust for provision of RPE and PPE, we had to do that working extremely closely with our colleagues in procurement, our infection prevention and control nurses, our microbiologists, um, our workforce and HR colleagues, our operations colleagues, in terms of making their rotors work and making sure that they were able to protect the staff who they needed to go and care for our patients. And actually, we also couldn't have done it without our local RPE specialist, who um, was actually kind enough to come out to us on um, Easter Sunday in April 2020, when we needed his support, which I think was absolutely above and beyond. OK. I think it's fair to say that I didn't understand the importance of supply chain resilience before the pandemic, but I really do now. OK, and when we're thinking about future pandemic planning, it must take into account the needs of diverse workforces. And again, I mentioned the report that was published earlier this week. We're really pleased to see that that acknowledges that requirement. So in terms of recognition, my trust has an annual award um, uh, ceremony. Um, this is my award. So myself um, and our head of procurement jointly were awarded the um, COVID-19 non-clinical individual award, which I'm quite proud of, actually, even though I'm showing you in this photograph exactly how hard it is to take a photograph of something reflective without showing the rest of the room. OK, but it's nice to get that recognition. And I think it probably has changed the perception of the health and safety discipline certainly within my trust and I suspect within um, UK, UK healthcare settings as well. So thank you for your attention. I'm afraid I've gone over by a few minutes. On this last slide, um, if you're interested in following up anything that I've talked about today, I've um, linked to some key sources and I hope that when the slides come out to you, those links will also work. So thank you for your attention. I'd just like to say thank you. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Very informative. Uh, You're quite welcome. Frightening in, quite frightening in some places when you we talk about the numbers involved. And if you think about, no disrespect, your your two hospitals in the in the UK. If you extrapolate that up to the UK, the the numbers must absolutely. be absolutely frightening. So um, I certainly really enjoyed that. Yeah. Thank you. So um, there are a few comments in the chat. I don't know whether there's any questions as such, but I think there was one earlier on. Yeah, I answered um, that, Stu. Right. 
Um, it was to do with. It was with one Kath. specifically to, to Kath, wasn't there? Yeah, 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 it was in relation to um, right, factors okay. of 100 yeah. for the port account. Okay. But I, I answered that and directed. Um, yeah, INDG 47, 47, nine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, has anybody got questions or any? Any anything that you'd like to add in to um, to say thank you to Kath or to ask any further questions? Hi, hey, Kath. Uh, Mark Parsons here, um, and thanks for allowing me to come in. Um, I, as you can guess by my accent, I, I'm not from England. Uh, I actually work for one of the health boards in uh, in Wales, uh, and I'm also the national health and social care chair for IOSH. Oh, right. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, great presentation. Uh, and having been given the reins of uh, dealing with this myself at the, the middle of March, uh, when it all kicked off, uh, I, I do understand your pain. Uh, I'm actually uh, amazed that you've gone through 22 different uh, models of masks. Uh, we didn't ha quite have that many in Wales, thankfully. Um, but obviously, um, things moved on. Uh, quite rapidly uh, with the masks, uh, you know, and we've, we've covered similar journeys to yourself. Uh, but the one thing I'd like to, to say, um, we, we are kind of lucky uh, in Wales, we've got uh, a surgical material testing laboratory, SMTL. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and, and Pete, who's the director of that, he's also uh, the director of the BSI. Mm -hmm. So they've actually written a specification now for a see-through uh, FRSM. They have, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I had a presentation with the guys who've developed it um, Wednesday of this week. Um, uh, and it looks really good. Uh, they've actually got CE, CE accreditation, so that will be coming out online shortly. Uh, and while I was there, they also showed me uh, an FFP3 half mask um, that, again, is see-through, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all anti-fog. Uh, it's got really tiny filters on the side, and you'll be pleased to hear it's got a filter on the front, so that takes away the element of the uh, the yeah. breath coming out on the patient. Um, yeah. So, and again, that's been developed uh, in conjunction with the uh, the innovation group, uh, which is four nations uh, led. Uh, but I yeah. know, uh, and I've been lucky enough to be on uh, national groups going uh, for PP uh, through the pandemic. Um, so got a lot of information firsthand, which was lucky. Um, but but again, yeah. with, with this FFP3 one, uh, it's really lightweight. Um, they're even looking now, following my discussions, they've already tested it on uh, going through the washer dryer or, or, or the autoclave at uh, uh, designated temperatures. Uh, and the efficacy is still there even after 50 uh, cycles. So it's just waiting its final certification to go through the C, uh, the CE marking. So again, that'll be something yeah. uh, I'll be putting on the uh, the IOSH Health and Social Care Group uh, website uh, when that's, that's uh, released. Um, but but again, it's uh, through thanks for people like yourself and others uh, providing feedback that these guys have been able to do this innovation. So you know that reward Absolutely. was well deserved, and uh, congratulations from me. I, I honestly think that I've never seen the market move as fast as it has now in provision. And I think there have been responses and, um, and you know, there's been a lot of flack about PPE supplies in the media, but actually what that hides is an awful lot of people, you know, really de dedicated civil servants and really dedicated technical people who have actually been trying to get the solutions going. I think the next game changer is those clear masks. So what we're doing at the moment is essentially isolating people who rely on lip reading. We're isolating people with autism who have trouble reading facial expressions and perhaps a partial facial expression is, mm. is harder. You know, smiling with your eyes is a thing, but perhaps that's not quite so accessible, you know, to everyone, that sort of thing. And um, I've been involved in a national panel on the clear surgical masks recently. Mm. So I suspect that might be the same one that's going through Four Nations approval at the moment. And I honestly think that they're going to have to become universal. And I think that one, once the market has responded in the production, the numbers are there, that they will become, because some of these disabilities are hidden and you simply don't know who you're disadvantaging by covering your face or covering your mouth in particular until they've had to tell you and it's too late then. You know, so I think there will be 
a massive change. And I think there'll be a move away from valved respirators as well. So I know that um, one manufacturer... I don't know whether you can see that. Neat. That's the actual yeah, that's, FFP3 one. That's really neat. Um, one of um, the... So we use quite a lot of um, Globus products because they're in the national chains mm. and so on. And I know that um, an unvalved version of the really very successful 3030B is on the horizon. When that comes, I think that will be a game changer because it's got a really good broad range of fit. Staff find it comfortable. And if we had that and a, an unvalved version of the S3V, I think we'd be home, to be perfectly honest with yeah. you. With it, you know. So it is reassuring to see that that feedback is is there, and particularly this message about smaller faces. Yes, definitely. You know, and say that FFP3 is going to come in three different sizes. It needs to. Mm. So when we've got reusables in use for our staff, we're always using the small, always. <laughs> yeah, I think we, I'm not one of those with a small petite face, but uh, many of our staff are. Yeah, absolutely. And um, mm. they all seem to work in theatres. It's a bit of a standing joke here as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, Margaret, you've got your hand raised um, over to you. Thank you very much. Now, I must apologise, guys. I'm in the car. I'm going to another meeting, but I I just kept it going on <laughs> on Zoom there. Um, Cathy, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, hugely interesting. I'm I have the privilege of being the RPE lead for NHS Tayside in Scotland. So, um, being like yourself, Cathy, front and oh no, we we we've lost you, Margaret. Margaret, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I've, it's okay. It's back again, I'm sorry. <laughs> Cathy, I think what I'll do is I'll put my email in the chat. I would love to catch up with you if that's possible. I'll be sad for this. Um, if, 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 if you didn't hear what I said earlier, I have the privilege of being the RPE lead for NHS Tayside in Scotland. Um, so obviously was really heavily involved with everything that's been going on. Lots of similarities um, in terms of pre-COVID and then obviously how we've had to respond uh, as part of it but obviously with me being in Scotland and yourself being in England there had there you know things then div diverged and we'd, we've gone off on different paths to a certain extent so more than happy to share and share with anybody because that's what we're all here for um, but if I put my email address in the chat we could maybe uh, get caught up at some point and and have a, a be reflection on that would be thank, you. thank you very much no, thank you. We know that there is some sort of cross fertilization really of ideas going on at the moment because literally before um, I joined tonight, I got contacted by our sterile services department manager. And I believe that he's speaking to NHS Scotland at the moment about the way that we decontaminate our head tops for our PPP APRs. Uh -huh. So I think absolutely, you know, this information should, shouldn't be squirreled away. It should absolutely be completely out in the open and shared because it's only for everyone's benefit. So that would be lovely. Yeah. I'd love to hear from you. Brilliant. Well, I've put my email in, in the the chat. So if you could maybe Fabulous. send a wee test one, then we can get caught up. But thanks, guys. I'm going, going to leave. Thank you very much, Cathy. That was super. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Has anybody else got any further questions? Any further comments? Um, I'm trying to keep up with the chat, but I don't think there's any any questions as such. Just bear with me while I scroll through. Um, Claire did answer one, but I think Bob's answered that. Um, thank you for Mark for that. Um, so I don't think there's any further questions. So unless anybody has got anything else to say. I'd just like to finally say thank you very much again, Kath, for that. It was really interesting, really scary, uh, really eye-opening. And as I said earlier on, if you just extrapolate that up, no wonder um, people were, were, were scratching around looking for FFP3 masks and gloves and whatever else it was at the start of it. Um, hopefully it will force organisations and the government to think about how they how they plan for such such a uh, such a pandemic in the future.
Um, we always think it's, oh, it'll never happen to us, but on this occasion it has. And it's just one of those things. It's a painful lesson, unfortunately. It's been tragic in many, many, many circumstances. But if we can learn from it, that's what safety, in my view, is about, is learning from what we've done, where things have potentially gone wrong, where we've, where we've done things that are really good, uh, and learning from both the, the things that didn't go bad, that didn't go well, and 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 did, and uh, taking that forward to, so that should something like this happen again, we'll we'll have those lessons to be able to learn from. So, thank Absolutely. you very much. If there's nothing else, I will say, uh, bid you good evening, and thank you very much. Thank you.